Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Aaron Baer uh, from Athena Health, and today I'll be talking about breaking apart the monolith and breaking apart our monolith um, at Athena Health as well. Um, so the first thing I want to do is <clears throat> give a shout out to my colleague, Ryan Walner. Um, original intention was actually that he was going to be presenting uh, this content to you today. Um, and, and much of that uh, comes directly from, from his brain. Um, but he was unable to make it. And so I also attending was able to step in for him. So welcome to everybody and hello. So myself, I've been building uh, business system applications for uh, 16 years at least. Uh, I've been working in the public cloud, AWS, Amazon space for five or more years. I love writing infrastructure as code. Um, that's been my primary focus for those last five years. So, um, you know, I've gone from the old school business applications, uh, writing ABAP and SAP, and, and coming up through all of that large IT organization infrastructure to now more recently working in the public cloud. I love to build things. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. I really like to build it. And so now I'm building things at Athena Health on the infrastructure team there. So thanks to Ryan and I'm Aaron. Hello. So often in the healthcare industry, technology sticks around for a long time. You know, um, it is uh, often becomes very old in that time. And so it's hard to break into that space with new technologies. Um, for example, one of the main focus, one of the main functions that Athena Health performs for the healthcare industry is processing faxes. So at Athena Health, we're trying to <clears throat> do a couple of things, unbreak healthcare, what we like to say. And what that means is we're trying very hard to bring all of the tedious, difficult workflow items of a physician's day or an office administration's day um, and free them from that and allow them to just be doctors, allow them to just be with their patients and allow them to focus on that information instead of processing like we do for many healthcare um, places all over. Uh, you know, we're processing hundreds of thousands of faxes a day uh, and <clears throat> not only just things like faxes, but there's still a lot of paper trail that exists throughout the entire industry. So with that, though, the healthcare industry is trying to go through a uh, digital transformation, moving its information into the digital world instead of in, out of, in out of filing cabinets. And the path to that that um, everyone is taking, but the health industry or companies like Athena Health are undergoing is that transformation from the giant monolithic application stack to microservices uh, and a more modern framework for that. So that, um, you know, we're, and in that, one of the challenges that we will always face, especially in the EHR market, which is another part of where Athena Health focuses a lot, is the adaption of new technologies into the, these offices, into the doctor's hands, into whatever um, that may entail. Um, so at Athena Health, we're trying to let doctors be truly doctors not have to spend six hours every day just doing their paperwork, helping to perform efficiencies in that space. <clears throat> so computing systems have been moving to cloud-based solutions 
and more hybrid models for quite a long, for not quite a long time, but for, for a while. And it's hard. It is difficult to do that. Um, I, I will say, since Ryan developed all this content, that um, slides and content and data uh, and, and the information that I'm sharing with you, although I work with on an everyday basis, is definitely new for me in presentation layer to you. So as we go through this, I'm going to reference notes. And, uh, and hopefully we'll keep this loose. So in that as well, if I'm speaking and I become a little bit unclear in anything, uh, we're gonna take questions towards the end, but feel free to just um, raise your hand and, and ask for that clarification at any time. So that being said, we're moving our products. Many other companies are trying to move their products into this space, the cloud space, the mobile space, um, as operators at the infrastructure level and developers at the application level, uh, moving into a much more flexible CI CD pipeline, making information access easier uh, at the application level and at the end user level, and provide platforms where information sharing becomes much more fluid and much more accessible. So another challenge or regular system thing that happens in our space being health information is that <clears throat> we're often also needing to deploy uh, that infrastructure in the old paradigm into sometimes the doctor's offices, um, into our uh, data centers and not as much in the past uh, into public cloud spaces as we're moving towards today. So what we're trying to do is strangle the monolithic design. Um, so I, and I'm here to talk about how we're creating our pathway towards breaking up this monolith and make our transition into the cloud um, because as an industry, uh, it's important, and it's time to be cloud more than it is to have our data locked up in silos and in a place or location that's difficult to, to interact with the data or move that data around or share it in between platforms. And at Athena Health, we have you know, your typical monolithic design. Right now, um, it's Apache, Perl, and Oracle. And it's in one big chunk. And all of it is dependent on all of the rest of it. And to expand that, you have to lift and shift the entire monolith. And what we have found is that it's also difficult to scale that monolith in any um, and so that you have a stack that can perform to a certain size, but the only way to continue to add customers to that or to add functionality to that or, or anything is to replicate the entire thing in another place and certain customers go to this one certain customers go to that one, certain customers go to that one, so on and so on and so on until you have all of these deployments of this big giant thing that is very unflexible. Uh, you're bound by that monolith to what data you can view, what data you can um, use, what data you can see, for instance, um, in the healthcare industry, a big trend is for merging large hospital groups into larger hospital groups. And if, say hypothetically, a, um, one customer was already Athena Health and merged into a hospital group that is also Athena Health, but they were already on two different Athena Health systems, there's a very big challenge for us to bring those together in a, in a useful way. And so why micro, microservices in that 
paradigm is because that scale. There's, <clears throat> there's no way to do that in the current monolithic platform. Uh, the other is that you know, you're bound by that technology stack for any innovation that you can make into the market. And so microservices and our path towards microservices is a way for us to be able to innovate faster um, so that someone can have an idea and write a service for that and tie into our data stack and have you know, something up and running within days where before um, you know, it may take quarters to get a release into the Perl code where one change might affect the entire, the entire application stack in itself. So also in that, as a large organization <clears throat> that um, is at the head of this uh, model in the healthcare industry, um, having that big monolithic stack makes it hard for us as an organization to continue to hire new talent that wants to come in and do something really exciting, right? Because we can say, oh, you're really smart. You've got 10 years or 20 years of writing applications and you're building all these things. Come work for us and you can write Perl and query data out of Oracle with SQL. I mean, that's not too thrilling. So our journey towards this um, microservice and um, mesosphere environment is to allow us to be more agno um, agnostic to, to what technology someone has to use to make something a part of Athena Health software offers across the board. So the challenge is then breaking apart that monolith, right? So you know, you've got this big thing and what we're trying to do is to get to all these yummy little pizzas all over the place that we can eat and consume at any time we want to. And the middle ground is breaking that apart in chunks, right? Everybody loves pizza. Everybody, everybody wants to have a slice. Everybody wants to do, um, to uh, um, make it easier to um, adapt into the overall platform so the one thing that is challenging but also very important is to avoid the distributed monolith, right? We can't just lift and shift this pizza all over the place. Um, we can't just take this big stack and containerize the big stack so that we can just launch this giant stack more times in a container. Um, you, you don't get any benefit out of that. You end up paying for, you end up paying a lot more uh, especially in the cloud space, for no actual platform benefit. Um, as you move towards this, you, the benefits you gain is, is you get a polyglot environment, right? You can think up of an idea, write it in whatever thing you want, and hopefully you're going to get the data that you need to make your application work and do um, really awesome things. Uh, but you're not going to want to be bound by that monolith to do that. And so we are using the strangler pattern to do that. So we choose to keep this big monolith around. We don't have too much of a choice to just get rid of it in one foul swoop. But what we feel like we can do well is move towards the microservice architecture over time, moving from the old to platform 2.0, which is what we might call that at Athena Health, and, and, and know that we can rely on what we have, and we can break off chunks and start net new information and products in this new model by just kind of squeezing pieces out of that monolith over time. So, you know, the reason why we choose to do that is that, um, one, it makes it easier to write net new functionality, right? With, with the monolith, you're bound by all the interdependencies of what that monolith represents. 
you're bound by you have to write in Perl. You have to know that, you know, not only is that host accepting the incoming queries for any requests to your application stack, um, but it's also, uh, you know, running the database, and that data is only one thing. It's a relational database. You can do a lot of stuff with SQL, but can you really do a lot of good stuff with your data in SQL or use it in different ways or move it into different patterns that you are able to um, support these new and exciting models that hopefully you're, you're coming up with in your head and, and hoping to become some part of the framework that we uh, want to provide to help the industry improve its efficiencies. So, you know, another thing that this helps you do is move more quickly into a pattern where you can uh, break things and fix them more quickly. You can, um, you know, testing the monolith is really hard, but testing a component of that monolith that I wouldn't even, uh, that's not actually correct, so you're not going to want to test a component of the monolith in this model, but testing that new functionality outside of the monolith in this model becomes um, a lot more easy, and um, you know, scaling that monolith with your business is really challenging. It's definitely a big challenge that Athena Health follows, um, finds in that you know, the only way we can scale is to repeat this giant thing. spoke to this just a bit but you know in the monolith you have your you know your classic three-tier web application you've got this big giant database that holds all of your data you have some component of your application stack that accesses that data you have a layer that's doing your business logic to that information and then you present that to the user in some way as a whole so our solution and, and um, what we're working towards is breaking that apart. And a really important part of that journey for us has been uh, POC evaluations of lots and lots of technologies. Trying them out, just figuring out you know, what works and what doesn't in a um, short cycle environment. And part of this as an organization, Athena Health has made a big change over the past year, moving to an agile um, method as a company. So not just in our DevOps teams, not just in our operations, and not just in, in um, as a department, what we call IAAS, um, but at the developer level and at the application developer level, reorganizing ourselves into scrum teams so we have smaller groups of people working on more focused points of the product and iterating on those projects much more quickly. So in doing that, we can function and we can perform these POCs more quickly. Um, the information that we learn out of those uh, can be shared amongst our groups more quickly. And as we find useful things out of that, um, we can start putting them in place. You know, one of our mandates or or needs uh, in the past year has been moving from only our data center. So this is going to represent Athena Health and its on-premise data center and all the components of what that is to the public cloud space. Uh, first being you know, Amazon, but we're already working in Azure. We expect to try to be um, agnostic in the plat the, the place where with we run applications, but build an environment and an ecosystem that is consistent across all of those at the same time. These are a number of the components that we've chosen so far that we're working towards right now. Um, DCOS, Mesos, Portworks, Docker, Docker, Docker. Amazon Web Services, which is uh, uh, the team that I work on um, in our group mostly. Um, Ryan uh, is, our, is a counter to me in our on-prem 
kind of um, activities and deployments of, of this so that we are moving to uh, an overall solution that that fits the microservice uh, platform really well. So our future state, as we are transitioning from that monolith, moving away from a single code base into a much more flexible, write what you want, use what technology you might need um, environment, allowing you to refactor and rewrite little components of your overall architecture stack much more quickly. Um, you know, if right now, if there's any component of our monolith that, that we want to change, it's likely that it's really difficult to do that because the, of the interdependencies of everything else in that application stack. Um, in this microservice model, you know, your goal is to remove that dependency from the rest of your infrastructure. So the component of that that you're deploying, um, you can pull it out, it can go away, and, or, and it can be replaced <clears throat> without the entire deployment need to be updated at one point. All of your patches to just go cleanly into the system on your, your, your second release of a quarter where if that doesn't happen, you know, you've got a systemic system-wide issue. In <clears throat> this smaller model, you have the ability to um, fail fast and fail forward. You can release small alpha products into this environment to try them out. It won't matter to the rest of your your stack because you can launch it, try a subset of people to it, pull it out, next release, release in beta, move it out into production um, much more quickly. <clears throat> Once you do that, then you can go back to your monolith and start pulling out bigger chunks of that monolith and moving components of that into your new infrastructure more efficiently and more successfully. So <clears throat> another key part of what we feel is important and what seems to be a really, in my opinion, smart idea is that you make sure that your infrastructure is also <clears throat> API driven that there is a level of ab abstraction from where you're running something uh, that your application developer doesn't need to worry as much about. Excuse me. So, um, you know, that, that API abstraction is key. Uh, a value that you can provide in that abstraction is that you can move your individual uh, business context outside of the platform with which you're running your containers or running your services into that API level so that um, you're not bound by having to know every single thing about what you need to run your application, and you can just run your application. Um, API-driven um, deployment can speed up your feedback loops from what you think is happening, what you think should be happening, and that, that loop back is important for moving more quickly with your deployments, your application development, and your overall uh, performance as a system. So, uh, so a large part of also moving to this model is, um, as an organization, following it at the organization level to an agile transformation like 
the infrastructure itself is making a transition to. And then you're hoping to push ownership of these services into the teams that are developing them, and you're not having to deal with services that you may or may not know anything about at an operations level or at the um, IT level, um, and allow the application team to deploy to the API, know that their system should be up and running, um, know that when they fail, they might be able to make their own update, their own iteration on that, um, and, and manage how their service is working independent of the platform that it's running on. Another very important functionality that this is providing for us is the ability to run our underlying, our underlying technology stack that these applications are running on anywhere we want to. And our API in front helps to orchestrate um, the, the need, the place where that container service may run. For example, this represents two different things. It represents exactly the same thing in two different places. So DCOS and Mesos running in AWS, uh, DCOS and Mesos running on-premise, bare metal in the cloud. Um, our front-end endpoint into uh, what is on-premise can reuse uh, the enterprise class net scalers that we already know as an organization and already utilize throughout our on-premise infrastructure and an ELB in front of how we get into our stack within on. But the abstraction layer <clears throat> allows you to post your payload to the overall system and make a choice as to where you want to put it or via business logic within the API itself help you choose the best place to run this. Um, in that, you know, you might need access to data that can't live in the cloud in the healthcare industry, possibly. And so you need to run on-premise. But you can rely on the platform in both places is exactly the same. You know, Mesosphere says operating system everywhere, operating system in the cloud. This is the, the, the place where we are and where we're, we're moving to. So a big thing in the monolith, a big thing in our challenge is silos of information. Giant Oracle databases that contain all of this important information, but there's no way, there's no easy way uh, to work with it in any model outside of SQL queries and Oracle and the way you get um, you know, information out of that relational database. You know, you can hire all of the super, super talented SQL Jedi's you can, um, but you still only have that data, in our case, not only in one place, but only in one place a bunch of times. And, you know, when you have your data like that, it is possible to affect um, other places where that data other places where you need to get that data in negative ways. Um, it makes it hard. And so, um, you know, a, a, a goal of our data layer is to extract that out of um, those silos and give the application developers their choice of where they need their data and how they need it. And write their applications to more effectively use sources so they can expand it out, put it all back together, tie it together, and, um, and then bring it back into the data silo right now, bring it back into the monolith for its overall storage uh, um, and interaction with our product 
as a whole or um, you know, expose it out of some new service that, ex that enhances our overall offerings to our customers. Um, internally, one of the ways that we do that um, is, I, I guess I learned this morning the SMAC stack, but components of that SMAC stack um, where we can stream data out of Oracle from on-premise and move it into the cloud and transform it in ways that make it much more useful. Um, and then services then can be deployed to use the data in that manner instead of having to call back into on-prem, select the data out of the big data silo, figure out what to do with it. The data is coming streaming in, it's being processed and transformed, and it can be put back to where it needs to be to um, enhance the overall you know, data records of patients in a, in a doctor's office or, or, or something along those lines. You give the application developer the, the ability to choose the right place to put its data or the right way to use its data instead of limiting them to this, this one way or no way uh, methodology. So, just taking a quick look here. Um, in this, I'm going to just kind of describe one of the ways that we might be able to do this. Again, we have our big silo of information, and we can take that data out, do processing in Spark. Um, there's a layer, this source agnostic CDC, for example, one way that we're transforming data out and distributing them amongst, doesn't matter what pla where, where the data is going necessarily, could be on premise, could be in the cloud. Um, pulling the data out with Kafka, streaming it, using Kafka Mirror Maker to distribute it very quickly to our other locations of our platform, um, using Spark to do uh, interesting data transformation or processing information on that, storing it back into new data stores within the platform itself. Um, it might go from Oracle to Kafka to Elasticsearch to Spark, back to Elasticsearch um, to uh, Neo4j. Um, and you uh, get that data out of the silo in a, in a really efficient way. And then you can distribute it across your platform, which your platform might be distributed across many different locations. Um, so <clears throat> with that, uh, there is a little bit of a demo here. And what we will see is our uh, business logic API endpoint into these two platforms um, where the application developer can um, define their marathon task um, in a way where they can either choose the destination they want their application to be deployed to um, and, and uh, or multiple locations and have a, a single API interaction but be able to uh, um, interact with all of our multiple uh, platform locations uh, to perform that. And I'll just let it play. Um, hopefully we can glean from this uh, what is happening um, and if and if we do end up with questions, I definitely can kind of answer those. But basically, it starts out with an API post asking for what are my environments available. And then it returns that I have this uh, available in a playground. I have it in Bedford, which is one of our data centers. And um, I also have a dev environment, which would be located in AWS. I can define my job. And in that marathon task, I can um, give these clues to where I want my job to run, how I want to run it, what's happening, when I run it. 
this hopefully is going to be posted. And we have a success. It is created. I can go back to my API and ask the environment for the status of what I have running. Um, font's really small on my side, too. So we're getting to basically what we're doing is interacting with launching a service in two different locations with a similar, uh, um, with the same definition of the task. We get information back. We know that how many instances are running uh, in both environments. And we're seeing that we're in two different environments. This is the same API interaction for the same service running in two different locations. And um, what we'll also be able to see is that we can post the API to manage the, the scale of that. And in the end, we have one place where a, a developer can interact with many systems across the um, environment. So planning is, is definitely a key to this. Um, just moving the monolith to somewhere else isn't necessarily the answer. Um, making uh, lots of POCs to experiment with technologies is really important. Um, some other challenges, uh, service discovery and load balancing is always going to be hard. Uh, start small. Start with uh, small components of your application stack that you may um, have or, or not. And then once you uh, are starting to get the handle of that, your organization has made that transition into this new model of um, deploying services and creating services, and then you can come back to your monolith and start pulling chunks out of it um, in a much more effective and much more easy way. Um, and you know, uh, the other thing that is difficult that you want to talk about sooner than later is is uh, you know ownership of who's who's on call for what, and um, you know instead of just typically throwing it over the wall to operations. Uh, this plan might help you better serve that and help to break apart your monolith. So with that, if there are any questions, I'm Aaron, at Slinus on Twitter. And um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, there's Mike here. So. You mentioned moving applications, and you also talked about the whole idea of streaming data out using Spark and stuff, which is cool. It's you know a materialized view and like writing applications for n like new stuff. But it doesn't really address the, one of the original um, problems that you talked about in the very beginning, which is the user sharding. Uh, I'm sorry, the user what? User sharding, deploying new instances of Oracle to be able to handle more users because you can't grow Oracle right. infinitely. And then another issue is that all of that data that's been streamed out is only, it's read only in general. You're not going to be able to stream it backwards back into Oracle and figure out which shard to go to and that kind of stuff. Or can you? Uh, I don't know. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> At Yelp, so we have a similar problem because we also, that user is so fundamental. We can't just break out the users into some user's service because it's too fundamental to the, the monolith. Right. right but from the monolith, you might be able to break out the authentication component, uh, or you might be able to break out a smaller component over time and pull that out. And just like uh, the streaming um, wouldn't be done processing. The, the processing would be done Spark times the streaming, in our case, is being done using Kafka and out of that. And, and in that as well, uh, hopefully, and in our case, uh, there can be an API in front back into the original data source. And so you can stream the data out, process the data, transform it into an answer for what you want, and then post it to an API that then gets consumed back into your original data source. That's also rewrite, but about the sharding, though. Any ideas on how uh, um, your company's going to help 
shard so, users? So with my knowledge base, I can't actually answer that question as far as the overall uh, structure of how, how they want to consume data back into the whole of Athena net. Um, but, uh, you know, it, that's a good question. It's probably answered many different ways, of course. Um, but uh, I don't think that streaming data out of a data source necessarily means that you can't put data back into that same data source after it's been processed in some way. Um, the key, I think, the takeaway would be try to make it as an API where you can post back to some location and then that, that service or that logic is able to determine the proper place to store that again. Thank you. Yep. All right, well, thank you very much.